Hello, this is Impact. It's the show that brings you the people who have an impact on your life here in Mountain View. I'm Robert Cox. I'm vice chair of the Old Mountain View Neighborhood Association. And we're here to talk in this special edition of Impact with three very important people here in Mountain View. These are three candidates for the uh, position of Mountain View City Council person in this election coming up in November of 2012. Uh, we'll be talking to each of the candidates a little bit individually so you get to know them personally. And we'll follow up with a roundtable discussion where we touch on some of the most important issues here in Mountain View. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit with our three uh, fine candidates here. We're going to start with uh, Margaret Caprilis. Uh, Margaret, um, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself and why you decided to run for City Council? Sure. Thank you, Robert, for having us here this evening. And I'm Margaret Caprillis, and I am a longtime resident of Mountain View and have raised four children in the area and really like the city and what we've done so far. We've done a good job. We've had a few missteps along the way, but I really would like to participate in making those critical decisions that we have ahead of us as our community grows. That's wonderful, Margaret. You know, I, each one of the candidates has brought some pictures here tonight so we can tell a little bit of a story about uh, their lives and, and give a personal touch to uh, their presentation to you tonight. Uh, let's look at the first picture. Uh, here's a picture of, uh, of Margaret back when she was uh, living in Florida. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I actually was born in South Carolina, but we moved to Florida when I was eight and I grew up in Florida actually watching missiles being shot off. My dad was involved with the missile program and that was the beginning of all the space program and the exploration that we have seen us accomplish today. So mm -hmm. it was an exciting time, but I was a teenager. So when my dad left for work very early in the morning, we would just say, well, where are the marshmallows? And we would head across to the beach and set a fire and have marshmallows. So we, we enjoyed doing that. That but. sounds pretty interesting. Hey, Margaret, you know, you also gave us another picture here. It shows um, a little bit after when you were a teenager, you entered into the business world and were uh, a person with an important position at Hewlett Packard. Isn't that right? Yes, it is. Uh, tell us about this picture here in Paris. The picture in Paris was an opportunity that I was offered by Hewlett Packard to go and work on a global project that was uh, to help all of our sites in the world to have a consistent database. And so it was based in Paris and I had a team that consisted of not only people that were French, but people that were from Russia and people from Japan and from all over the world to just make this right. So I was there for three years and the picture is a picture of that team that we had together working on that project. So a uh, great opportunity, a great experience to know people from many different cultures. Well, we all know that Hewlett Packard has been one of the icons of the business world here in uh, Mountain View and in the surrounding area in Silicon Valley. Um, what did you learn in your time when you were at Hewlett Packard that, that prepared you for the idea to seek a seat here on council? I think one of the things that Hewlett Packard taught us all was that it's important to be collaborative and it's important to have a very good process in place in order to reach some really tough decisions. So I think just having been in that environment for over 27 years, I bring that professional skill set so we listen to all of the opinions and the data that comes in to the council in order to make the right decision with the information that we have at that particular time. Mm. That sounds very impressive. Margaret, um, you've told me that you have a, a large family here in Mountain View. Uh, you have four uh, children and uh, nine uh, grandchildren and that uh, they cover quite a large area in Mountain View in the different places they live. Can you name some of the neighborhoods that uh, that uh, your family lives in? Yes, actually our uh, one of our daughters lives in East Wisman and another lives in the Crossings area. And we believe that 
those particular change areas are very important that we develop them just as best we can and to make sure that the neighbors in each of those neighborhoods are involved in putting their opinions forth and so we can really know that what we're doing for that neighborhood is not only agreeable from a city perspective but definitely for the neighborhoods that are already there. Well, thanks very much, Margaret. I enjoy talking here in the introductory part. And now we're going to move on to uh, Chris, who is a member of Mountain View's uh, Environmental Planning Commission. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So the Environmental Planning Commission is the, it's an advisory body to the city council. And uh, what we have the opportunity to do is to review uh, proposals, primarily development proposals before the city, any changes to our general plan or, or major changes to, to zoning. And so that get, provides a lot of experience with, with land use and zoning, which is a, a fair chunk of what the city council ends up doing. So we'd like to think that we get to delve into the nitty gritty and really study everything and make really good formal recommendations to the city council, which they can review and then act upon. Well, that's pretty interesting there, uh, Chris. I'm sure that good experience would be a good background for a, a position on council. Um, now let's move on to your pictures that you've uh, uh, ready to show us here. Uh, here's an interesting picture of you with, uh, with a, a farm animal. Yes. Uh, tell us about that. <laughs> well, we, uh, I grew up on a farm in Illinois right on the border with Iowa along the Mississippi River, and we have uh, corn, soybeans. I, when I grew up, we had corn, soybeans, and pigs primarily, and then um, after I left, they decided goats would be a good idea. So that's a picture of me when I was back at home um, in, the, in the winter with a, one of our newly born uh, goats. But um, I, you know, I growing up a farm was a was you know Mountain View I think has a lot of um, a lot of folks who are transplants at, at one uh, at one stage of life or another, and I think that's one of the things that makes us pretty unique is our diversity and you know growing up on a farm really you know instills the values of, of of hard work and and pragmatism and just getting things done and I you know enjoyed my time there but after 18 years was ready to uh, was ready for a change so. Oh, nice. Ended up out here for, for college and then um, loved it so much that I decided to stick around, which I think uh, has happened to a lot of folks who well, that, that, visited that's pretty stayed, neat, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, in this other picture here, you're showing that, uh, that uh, you're, uh, something about your work as an executive in one of the startups here in uh, Mountain View. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to... Uh, one of the reasons why I stuck around is I have a little bit of a techie in me, so the, both the laid-back nature of the West Coast and the and it being kind of the, the tech capital of the world really appealed to me, and um, in particular, the, the, the startup culture. So we, we built a company um, from the ground up that uh, worked on basically a location in, in mobile, um, mobile social networks. And so that was really interesting just to see that go through from, from start to finish, and we were recently acquired. But in a small environment like that, you get to wear many hats. So whether it's finance or operations or par managing partnerships and those types of things, it provided a, it's a work hard, play hard thing, but it, at the end it provides a lot of, I think, unique experiences along the way. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, hopefully has provided a little bit of background for me in terms of uh, you know, finances and managing um, a company from from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think is the the thing that you take from your experience, uh, both as a uh, planning commissioner and in working at a startup, that that you'll bring to the council? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting the two different worlds. So, I've I've worked, you know, growing up, I worked in the public sector both for a little bit in the House of Representatives uh, on staff, and then for the State Department. But then you see. You know, in the private sector, especially right after college um, and working there since college, um, I really have learned a lot in terms of you know how you run a business in the private sector, whether it's the finance, the background in finance, and just making sure that all the working on a shoestring budget, making sure that every dollar is counted and and that we're getting the best bang for our buck. And then on planning commission, you know, the more public sector things like land use and and zoning um, and you know making sure that the city is well well run and managed financially I think are, are important pieces of that. Okay well thanks very much Chris it's been uh, good to get to know you a little bit better and now we're going to move on to our third candidate uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Neal. Uh, Jim uh, you've uh, 
you're somebody who's well known in, in most, uh, particularly in the most recent days, on a number of uh, important issues that have come up at council. Why don't you tell us uh, what those issues were? All right. Well, uh, a lot of the uh, issues that I've been uh, talking about the most are the budget. Uh, to me, that was very important to speak about the budget because Mountain View currently is $4 million in debt, uh, or at least has a $4 million deficit that they make up through various uh, accounting, uh, through various areas of accounting. So I'm concerned about the fact that most of the uh, debt that uh, Mountain View has accumulated has come from the salaries and the pensions that Mountain View is paying for. Basically, salaries and pensions account for 83 percent of Mountain View's budget. And over the next few years, that's going to go up. So I believe that we need to have some type of a plan that will move the budget from the current, uh, the current format that they're using to something that's more like a 401k, where uh, we can manage the funds uh, a lot better and also have the employees put more towards uh, their retirement. Uh, another thing is a plastic bag ban. I'm against uh, that ban because there are certain things in there that concern me, one of which is the 25 cent fee that the, the city of Mountain View wants to have the stores charge people. I'm not sure where they get the authority to have the stores charge that money, uh, how they can just tell them what to charge for, for instance, if they were going to have the stores charge, uh, you know, ten dollars for a bag of sugar because they don't want sugar anymore, mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, I'm not. Excuse me. I'm not quite sure where that authority comes from. So those are some of the issues that I've been talking about um, in the city council. So we want to look at uh, your pictures too that you brought tonight. Sure. Uh, they say that uh, everyone loves a man in uniform. <laughs> so uh, here's a picture of, of the young Jim Neal in uniform. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Right. Well, that's a picture of me uh, when I entered the Air Force. Basically, when I was younger, I spent a lot of time working in restaurants and things of that nature. And I actually thought I wanted to have a career working in the restaurant industry. However, it didn't uh, lend itself to a lot of opportunities for promotion uh, or for advancement. So at that point, I talked to my father about things. And my father had also been in the military. He was also in the Air Force. And he suggested that I go that route. At the time, they were giving money for school, and they were. I felt that they would also give me an opportunity to learn a skill and a trade. I was interested in computers, and when I went into the Air Force, that's actually what I wound up doing, is winding up uh, working with computers, and that gave me the basis to then come here later to Silicon Valley and uh, get involved in the computer industry here. Oh, that's pretty neat. And then you have another picture here. Uh, it uh, it shows something from your family history. Right. Uh, you seem to come from a, a line of people in politics. Tell us well, about that. I wouldn't say it's exactly a line. Uh, it's uh, it's a picture of uh, my grandfather and uh, uh, his uh, wife and my two aunts, along with my father holding me as a baby when my father was running for uh, a house seat um, in uh, in the state of Ohio. So uh, it does show that um, uh, that my family does have a little bit of a political background, but um, obviously we're you know we're not Rockefellers and <laughs> we're not Kennedys. Okay. Uh, another thing that I've heard is is that you know uh, I remember reading your uh, poem about uh, the smoking ban. Right. And tonight you've uh, you've brought with you another poem that you've written uh, about another important issue for those of us particularly living in the downtown area, the yes. high speed rail project. Exactly. Uh, why don't you read that for us? All right. Thank you. So I wrote this because I'm very concerned about the effect that high-speed rail is going to have um, on the city of Mountain View. I, th I think it's going to be, um, it's going to have a lot of negative impacts. So uh, here we go. Uh, the state wanted to give us high-speed rail, but instead gave us a high-speed epic fail. They told us all it was a solution to all the crowded roads and the pollution. They told us all there was nothing to fear, but to balance HSR's pollution will take 30 years. There have been many versions of their scheme, but it's nothing more than a high-speed pipe dream. From the beginning, I thought something was funny. Where will they get the other 80% of the money? The cities don't have it. The state's flat broke. The federal government, maybe? <laughs> yeah, that's a good joke. All the, taxpayer, all the taxpayers had better be wary, because soon they'll say it's funded by the tooth fairy. Hold on to your wallets. It won't be a surprise. When they soon tell us all that taxes are on the rise. It's something we don't want, and we don't even need. It's just another plan to feed a few people's greed. That's it. Well, that's a creative poem and a, <laughs> and a good uh, segue into our, 
uh, round table discussion where we're going to be talking about several of the issues that are important here to the people in Mountain View. So let, let's uh, move into that segment right now. And uh, thank you, uh, Jim, for setting the stage for the discussion. I think we, you've made it pretty clear what your op opinion here is about the high-speed rail. Uh, I want to move on to uh, Margaret. Uh, Margaret, you've uh, mentioned to me several times that you have an interest in the uh, future of transportation here in Mountain View. Uh, what do you think about Jim's poem, and what's your view of all this? Um, <clears throat> I actually think that it's very, very difficult to uh, look at the future 30 years from now. That's one thing that's really difficult. The high-speed rail, from what I understand and from my perspective, brings uh, electrification for the Caltrains and a much badly needed new cars for Caltrain. It is an old system and the tough part about those issues, I think it's the de devil is in the details. Mm. And I see that uh, the, the only way to get the improvements on Caltrain and to the electrification of the tracks was to accept that whole package. And I think as we understand more and more about how these bills are introduced, many times they tack things on that make it very hard to say no when you realize you have to have that improvement. Mm -hmm. So often we have to take that risk. I think it's been voted on. How it will be implemented will be interesting to see, mm -hmm. but I think it's one of those things that looking into the future we need to, we need to say, well, they made the decision with what the information they had they took a risk. They felt like for Northern California, we really did need to have the improvement on that Caltrain. And so I think they, they took that risk. Uh, Chris, uh, what do you think about the high-speed rail in particular? Can you talk about the various alternatives? We've talked about a blended alternative where there might be uh, two tracks with uh, Caltrain and the high-speed rail, and some people want to go as high as uh, four tracks all the way uh, down the peninsula. Yep. What's your view? So I think, you know, just from a, a 10,000 foot, uh, foot perspective, I think we have all been frustrated, you know, in past years and now with, with the transportation infrastructure that we have or the lack thereof. And I think what voters were saying, um, you know, when they voted for high-speed rail was, you know, we need to think big. We need to think outside the box. And, you know, having a, an alternative method of transportation down, down the peninsula and then down south, I think, made sense to people. And they were really willing to think big at that at point. I think, do some folks have some remorse at this point? Based on, I think so. And I think that's, it's less the idea of high-speed rail and more how it's been managed up until this point. And maybe getting in a little bit over our heads, um, mm -hmm. especially with something as long as long term of this. Now, I think Margaret hit the nail on the head when, it, when she said, you know, there are there are going to be benefits from it one way or another. And I think the way that we need to approach it at this point is rather than look at, um, it, first of all, we need to obviously fix the mismanagement that's occurred. But I think we also need to, as a city, from a strategic perspective, knowing that it's been voted on in the legislature as well, and is at least the first part of it is moving forward, we can take advantage of some of the things that have been proposed, like the blended system where we can electrify Caltrain, we can meet a lot of the needs that we need already um, in terms of grade separation, um, electrifying Caltrain, so we reduce the noise um, and we have a more efficient system. And then you know, we'll have to look at you know, where we go from there. I wish they hadn't started building um, things in the middle of, of California. I wish they had focused the resources on doing things that, that can be a benefit to us today. Um, because I think there are a lot of those things like electrification. Now, in terms of the alternatives, yes, um, does a blended system make sense? I, I think it makes a little bit, you know, initially I would have been skeptical of that, but I think having looked at it, it makes a little bit more sense from a, from a financial and implementation perspective. Um, and we'll have to look at, you know, hope, hopefully we can get some sort of uh, trench or underground option as opposed to obviously we don't, we want to have as few you know, new barriers erected in the city as possible. But hopefully, um, I, my hope is that where this is, where it's at now is we can use it from a strategic tr perspective to hopefully secure funding and um, to at least meet our interim needs 
um, with electrification and, and grade separation. I want to move to another important uh, issue here uh, facing the uh, voters of Mountain View, uh, and that's the budget, you know, because uh, as uh, Jim brought up earlier, um, many California cities are not as fortunate as Mountain View is today. Um, recently, uh, the cities of uh, Vallejo, Stockton, and San Bernardino have all declared bankruptcy. And uh, there's, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the causes behind that and what the solution's going to be. Um, since you brought it up first, Jim, I'll, I'll let you expound on that a little bit more. Okay, well, uh, the number one cause for all those cities filing bankruptcy is pretty much what I said before, that uh, the majority of the city's budget uh, goes to salaries and pensions. And, of course, you're not going to cut, uh, you know, people completely. You're not going to get rid of their pensions. You're not going to cut their salaries down to nothing. Um, that would be inhumane to do. But one of the things that I think that cities should be thinking about, um, as I mentioned earlier, is converting to something that's more like a 401k plan, something that's sustainable, something that's manageable, and something that's reasonable. And you don't do it immediately with the people that are already working and that you've already uh, made commitments to them 30 years ago. You start with the people that are coming in new, and you gradually make that change over time. And I think by doing that, you, uh, be, you come up with a sustainable budget that is manageable and something that isn't going to uh, you know, take the city uh, down, into, uh, down that road. Mm. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, Margaret, why don't you follow up on that? Do you, do you think Jim has the right idea, or would you uh, propose something different, or what's your view? Well, I think that that is something that the city is already looking into okay. from my perspective, and I think that over the years the, uh, the employees and the city have worked together very, very well. I think there is a transparent process for the uh, city to share what the budget is with the employees and say this is where we need to go. So it's a collaborative effort and it is an effort by both the employees and the city to say what is a win-win situation for both of us. Mm -hmm. I think that those cities went, that went bankrupt had already borrowed from their pension fund and had spent that for other items in those cities and I also think that many of those cities purposely went bankrupt so they would have the leverage to break some of those contracts which may or may not been very good for those mm -hmm. cities. So those were decisions that were made in the past and I think it's a, it's, it's a shame that they mm -hmm. got to that point where they declared bankruptcy so they could break those contracts and start everything anew. So. I think that Mountain View has got that open process, a collaborative process, and I think we can achieve some of those goals mm -hmm. knowing that the employees don't want to have mm -hmm. a city that's broken, they don't have a job, mm -hmm. and the city, vice versa, has no intention of going broke. Mm -hmm. And I want to make a point here that City of Mountain View is one of the best managed cities in Silicon Valley. We maintain mm -hmm. a 25% cash reserve that we do not touch with w our budget. It's an absolute extreme mm -hmm. emergency that we would use that. Mm -hmm. And I, that I am very proud of and I want to continue that. Makes sense, Margaret. Uh, Chris, you talked a little bit when you were talking about being at a, at a startup, having to be financially responsible and, and watch every penny. Yep. What's your view of how things are in Mountain View with this and, and how are we going to avoid the problem that these other cities have encountered? Yeah, I think we're, we're unique in a very good way in that we have been very conservative over the last few decades in making sure that, as Margaret touched upon, not only that we have a reserve, but we are very unique even in, in this area um, in the Bay Area in that we have very good, um, uh, very good uh, collaborative relationships with our employee groups. And we've over the years, even before, um, even before these crisis times, we were able to negotiate long ago um, folks kicking in far more of the pension and cost sharing, um, far more of the cost sharing piece of it than many other cities were able to negotiate even in the worst of times. So we've always had a very collaborative relationship with our employee groups and that's something that we should continue. And quite frankly, you know, as a startup you count every penny and Mountain View over the last couple of decades has been very good about making sure that we manage things as conservatively as possible, that we set aside, um, we have a reserve that we don't touch 
and that we only spend as much as we need to spend. And uh, I think that's something that we need to continue. We are at the opposite end of the spectrum. We have some, you know, as you mentioned, some large cities uh, filing for bankruptcy, and we're lucky in the sense that we've maintained, we're one of a handful of cities that have a AAA credit rating even through the end of this, this mm -hmm. rough period. So it's, it's less a, it's not, this isn't a time where I think where you go in and blow everything up. It's more um, what, it's looking at how we optimize what we have today and continuing, and continuing to really well um, manage the city from a fiscal perspective. And we are, you know, we have made a lot of cuts over the years, not just in, in with employees um, agreeing voluntarily to cut things um, and reducing our costs, but also, you know, we have a, we're pretty thinly staffed right now. And mm -hmm. we've got a lot of folks, you know, doing overtime and, and working, quite frankly, more hours than they probably ever thought they would. So we mm -hmm. have we have a very collaborative um, mm -hmm. uh, relationship with our groups, and I think that's something that we should continue and and recognize that and and you know when we have the opportunity, thank them for that because we could be we could be in a much worse situation than mm -hmm. we're in right now. And y you've seen that with some of the cities that I think have you know not been managed as well over the years. Mm -hmm. And we thankfully have even in the best of times made sure that we were counting every penny and making sure that we were keeping costs under control, whether it's employees or whether it's just costs from the, or running the city in general. Okay, well thank you. Now that was a really interesting discussion of the issues and a wonderful opportunity to meet these three fine candidates for our city council election here in November. I want to thank very much our three candidates, uh, Margaret Caprilis, Chris Clark, and Jim Neal for coming out tonight and giving you the chance our viewer here to get to know them better and make an intelligent choice about who you want to represent you and your city government this year. Uh, I'm Robert Cox, at, uh, signing off here at Impact. Thank you so much for viewing today.